the ransomware attack just at one time was ransomware. But now what we're seeing is a double-headed attack or a double tap. They're gonna come in and they're going to ransom your data, but they're also gonna exfiltrate your data first. And then they're going to try to get you to pay twice, once for the decryption key, and then another time for them not to release the data that they stole. Hi, I'm Lori Varner. I'm an incident commander with Cisco Talos Incident Response. What I do is I help run incidents with our customers when they're having some of the worst days of their lives. We come in and we can help them do the investigation to find root cause analysis. In the majority of our cases is just ransomware everywhere. Everybody is a target. Everybody's fair game. Even during the pandemic when our hospitals were at capacity, Around the world, they did not care. Hospitals were a fair target. Ransomware has been around for an extremely long time. A lot of people don't realize it actually dates back to 1989. So the first example was the AIDS Trojan, which was actually distributed via five and a quarter inch floppies, as this was the days before the ubiquitous internet that we all uh, know and love. My name is Edmund Brummagen. I am a security researcher with Cisco Talos. My main objective at work is to try to make days as painful and as costly as possible for the bad guys that are trying to attack organizations and individuals on the internet. We're seeing series do a lot more research before they begin conducting a lot of the attacks that we're seeing. You know, they're, they're taking advantage of public uh, information related to organizations. So they're doing a lot more on the front end to determine how to hurt the victim the most. Again, because it's all about trying to maximize the likelihood that they will be able to convince the victim to pay them. We're not talking about, you know, 100 megs of data or something like that. Many of these leaks are 500, 700 gigs of data, right? So it's a tremendous amount of data. I'm William Large and I'm a threat researcher here with Talos. I always love to try to give the elevator pitch for what we do. Essentially, it's finding anomalous behavior in either network traffic or software or anything like that and just trying to find the bad guys. Essentially what happens in a ransomware campaign often is it starts with the spam campaign. And that typically will kick off the first stage of the infection process. So they're either going to infect the user with malware by having them click on a link or open a document that downloads malware, or they're going to send the user to a credential theft website. Land on the landing page, that page will serve up uh, one small piece of the binary that will install and again just achieve persistence or not even do that or simply do reach out to find another more malicious binary. They're going to come in and they can quickly take a lowly regular account and they can do privileged escalation. In a lot of cases the, the first malware payload that's delivered to a system in the environment is not necessarily the ransomware itself. It's typically a payload that an adversary can use to begin operating in the environment so that they can deploy ransomware at a later time against all of those systems simultaneously. If they can get into the network and achieve persistence, that can be on a thermostat, it can be on a Google fridge, any a little IoT device that someone plugs in so they have better Wi-Fi. If they can live there, then they can leverage a law bin. Living out the land binaries are Windows binaries um, that are built in, and they generally are benign in usage, right? Like, there are things that admins and Windows use on a daily basis. And these living out the land binaries are being leveraged by adversaries to move quietly within the internal networks. Then they're on your domain controller in a very short period of time. So that they can begin to start to focus on that most sensitive data, the most critical data in the environment, steal that, exfiltrate it to their own servers. And what they're doing often is double extortion. Where not only do they encrypt everything in the environment, but they also say, yeah, and also if you do not pay us, we will release all of this critical data to the entire world via data leak sites and websites that the threat actors operate. If you don't pay them, then you're not, your data is still encrypted and they're going to release the data they stole for the rest of the world. What, whatever proprietary information that you don't want out there, they're going to try to get you to pay to keep it silent. And this is the answer to people not paying is by daring, uh, daring to leak their data onto the dark web. You've got two complete different ends of the spectrum. You've got very sophisticated that have been resourced by millions and millions of dollars in ransom payments over the past several years, all the way down to it may be a single you know, individual that's just trying to make it some money via single system ransomware deployments. We've seen a large increase in uh, the uh, use of cryptocurrency and ransomware, essentially because there's ransomware as a service now. One of the big things that these ransomware as a service or RAS platforms offer potential cyber criminals is the fact that you don't have to dedicate resources into developing your own 
own ransomware family. They provide kind of an entire package suite, and so with a much lower skill set, you can run ransomware against a much larger entity, right? So there are a lot of uh, resource-based benefits that you know a, a single person could potentially benefit from by working with these larger organizations. Money's money. They're a money-making business, so they're going to look for that look for that paycheck wherever they can. Ransomware is extremely profitable, right? We did uh, some looking and, and it wasn't even a, it was a non-exhaustive research into like Ryuk and different campaigns like that. They were uh, operating at well over a hundred million dollars for their active campaign, Revil, Darkside, all over a hundred million dollars. A lot of people had good recovery postures for ransomware at first because you know we had a deluge of ransomware and then it died down a little and it came back with cryptocurrency. Bitcoin has really helped uh, fuel that growth. Cryptocurrency and ransomware are tied hand in hand and have been for a while. And one of the most important factors in that is with a cryptocurrency, you don't have to pull in a bank. It provides a very easy anonymous way for the threat actors to hide what they're doing, hide their money, hide their transactions. For organizations that are interested in mounting a strong ransomware defense, there's no one single silver bullet. To have a strong ransomware defense requires um, really a lot of steps. It's again the layering of the onion, much like we've talked about over time, but it just grows over time because things become more complex. Organizations can take steps to make sure that they are maximizing their defensive architecture and their defensive capabilities prior to being involved in a ransomware attack. A lot of this comes down to deploying a complementary set of security controls in the environment that all work together. The best ransomware defense that a that an enterprise could have is to have that security tooling, making sure that you've got protection on all of your endpoints. Because any one of those endpoints, a remote employee's uh, desktop to an internal server, they're all gateways into your network. The, the challenge at hand is there's a balance between <clears throat> knowing that you have to train the users and, and then knowing that even with a well-trained user base that sometimes things are going to happen. People are busy, they work long hours, they're going to click those links, right? And so that's where security devices, security posture, and security process comes into play. And this is where an organization like Cisco Talos comes in. One of the things we try to do uh, whenever we have research that we feel like organizations should be aware of and should pay attention to, is we try to publish as much of that information as possible uh, for the entire security community, right? To help raise the bar for the entire industry, not just for our customers, but for organizations that may potentially be impacted as well, just to make the internet a safer place, because that's one of the, the directives that, that we have, is help make the internet a safer place for everybody.